All right, cool. So what's your uh, ideology on training and switching it up? Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think people try to want it. Well, they want to switch it up way too often. Um, I think uh, for, for, you know, God, I've been doing this shit since I was 18. I'm 45. Um, I think at this point, you know, people always used to say, you better do the exercises that you don't like. And you know what? Um, I don't know that I also necessarily believe in that. Uh, I do the exercises that I feel the most in my body parts. And as I've become older, I, I do a lot of machines. I know David said compounds, and that's great. But there's some days my SI joints just aren't going to let me squat heavy. Now, I can go 225 if I do it towards the end of my workout, and it's more like, you know, for the range of motion and getting a little bit of the weight on. But it's not going to be anything where it's like, necessarily pushing ERs. Um, so for me, I do a lot of, I do a lot of, uh, training on, uh, machines and it's funny, you know, my gym setup is spread out in machines and then in the backgrounds where all the like compounds are. So all the young kids are in there thinking they got a bench press and do all these things. And I'm, I'm the old guy in the, in the little, the girl room, it looks like, you know, on the machines and stuff, but I don't really care. It's, uh, for me, that's what feels, I can feel the best. So my point is I do, I do that I'll do, if I find a machine I love, I'll, I'll milk it for everything I can. And if it takes me, uh, six months to finally max out the stack and do a stack of 12, really good. So be it. Um, because I, my body, I can feel the muscle work. So yeah, the answer is I don't get to train, change things, change things out that as often as people think with my own clients, I do about 10 weeks just cause people, a lot of people do get bored, but I've had clients like male bodybuilders and a few other people who really understand this. And they're like, listen, man, I, I love this split. Everything's feeling good. And we've, we've milked it for six months and then I'll just finish, you know, none of us are, are, are Ronnie Coleman or Dorian Yates, but those guys pretty much use the same training year after year. Um, so, you know, whoever that's worth. When I say compounds, by the way, I'm fine with machines. I actually prefer Smith incline press much more than a barbell incline press. Got it. Um, and I don't really think that flat bench is as mandatory as people make it out to be. I know it's a bread and butter for a lot of people, but when you get older and your shoulders start hurting, flat bench is one of the worst movements when you have bad shoulders. It doesn't matter how good your form is. I mean, I've had a blown out shoulder for five years and it's a movement I can't do. Yep. And there's a reason for it. Yep, 100%. Um, let's see here. Uh, what else do we got? All right. Um, can you significantly do a physique transformation obtained in someone who is a true beginner, uh, no previous athletic or bodybuilding background, and is greater than 60 years old? So it's like a part two question. I'm trying to find it just so I can read it. Yeah. It's up all the way up towards the top. Uh, what was that? Oh, shit. Fennel 136 sent it. Shit, I still don't see it. Um, we're, read it one more time. Just give your highest me. question and you read it. You, you read, see where you can read to, and then um, we'll go off whatever question you can see. My my first answer is it's never too late to start. That's like waiting to start a business, and you start a business at 60 years old, and there have been plenty of people starting a business at 60 years old and become extremely wealthy and successful. So, Yeah, what was the question? Just getting started later in life? Yeah, getting started later in life, around the age of 60 or, or beyond. Okay, I'm I mean, you know, like David said, you might as well get started, right? Like the days are going to pass. So is it better to have, you know, that weight training behind you as you, as you, as you push into your seventies, 100%, uh, can you gain muscle as fast as someone that's 21? No. Um, you know, but at the same time you can take, take your time and, uh, you have wisdom behind you hopefully. And, uh, you know, you can build a, a respectable amount of muscle, I would think. Hormones are going to come into play. You know, if you're female and you've got none, it's going to come into play. If you're a male, and I see more and more young men with poor hormone profiles, so by the time I'm 60, if I wasn't taking TRT, it would probably be terrible. Um, all that's going to come into play on what you can accomplish. Um, but, yeah, get, get started. Nothing like the present. Yeah, this is a really good question. And hormones, yeah, we can go down that rabbit hole all day, but at 60 years old, Get your labs tested um, as a baseline and just see where you can improve it. Some A lot of men can improve cholesterol at that age, just minimum. Um, I have a woman who was put on spirolactone for acne, was on rounds of antibiotics during harsh pregnancy, has low blood pressure, thinks she has adenosines, but electrolytes look normal. <laughs> okay. Do you want to start there? Let, yeah, start I, mean, all, I asked them before like what was their question like 
I, are you wanting to like get them off spring like that? Are you asking, should they be on it? Like, I didn't know what they were actually like asking of us. I don't, I don't know. Because that's a really in-depth question. And there's a lot of moving pieces there. Being on harsh antibiotics for a long period of time is never good, especially during a pregnancy because the microbiome, there are correlations to issues with pregnancy and the microbiome, um, genetics. So spirolactone, I think spirolactone is one of the worst drugs ever created. I don't know about you, Jason, but I just don't feel like for acne, it's one of the worst tools that you can use. Now I understand it and why it's used, but. I'm not really for spirolactone in any case. I, I, so, you know, I own an HRT clinic and we do script it sometimes. I really like it if like a female is having like uh, hair loss and you can't get it under control. Um, I don't really love it for acne. I feel like there's better ways to get to the root cause of it. You know, usually it's obviously not obviously, but a lot of times it's a, it's a hormonal imbalance. And if you get things right and get the cycles regulated, especially with women, you can get it under control. So you don't really need the sprinolactone, but, uh, I think it, I think it can be useful. Like if hair shedding is kicked off, um, you know, whether that's starting TRT or, you know, for some other reason, I think it, I think it can help. Maybe they got PCOS and we're trying to calm it. Um, so I've used it there. Um, but overall, if it's put, if it's an acne thing, I try to get my clients off of it, but I first balance their hormones and then back them and then back them off of it. Um, so if that was your question, you know, certainly you might want to check with their, their hormones if they were put on it, uh, for, for acne. And I think they said that. Yeah. So spirolactone on hair loss. So I'm a huge fan of quinoconazole. Quinoconazole, I swear is the godsend for hair loss. Uh, it's a weaker antiandrogen, but you don't get many of the side effects that you would with something like a spirolactone, even a finasteride. Finasteride didn't work for me, actually. Uh, Ketoconazole. And then if someone's having actually hair loss due for their gut and candida overgrowth, then it works really well for the antifungal properties. But you just have to make sure that the scalp doesn't get too dry. And then a non-FDA legal drug, RU58841, is phenomenal because it doesn't have high binding affinity to the androgen receptor, but it seems to work very well topically. Um, so what was, that the, what was that last one? Are you five, eight, eight, four, one? I don't, I don't think I've heard of that one. I don't, I don't even know. I wonder if we have that at our clinic. I haven't heard of that one. Well, it's not FDA. So you, you may still have it at the clinic, but I would highly doubt it. I'll send you some information on it after this. It's a really cool compound. Someone said, what is that called for hair loss? You want to say it one more time? Oh, so ketoconazole, the easier way to remember it is you can get 1% topical off of Amazon, the brand it's called Ninzerol AD, and then RU58841 is the anti-androgen. That's a stronger anti-androgen than a ketoconazole. Yeah. So I don't know if we answered your question, because I'm not really sure there was a question per se, but, you know, th there, there you go. Uh, if there is a specific question beyond that, let us know. Uh, what else we got here? There's been a lot now i'm trying to back up <laughs> yeah i'm like trying to go down um so instagram's been having issues they really awesome. ought to make it easier or like slow it down yeah well there's a way where people can actually type in their questions into a question box but most people don't use it um okay do you believe do you believe is mesocycle based training to bring up lacking body parts while keeping recovery bank as route to base to mitigate around recovery with natural athletes versus enhanced. Are you following that question? Uh, I'll be honest with you guys, you're getting way too complicated on training for me. Uh, maybe David knows what the fuck that's saying. I, I have no fucking <laughs> okay. clue. Um, so I, I'm just going to let David talk and, and maybe he has an idea, but I, I keep training so fucking simple. I don't know what the half that shit is saying. Yeah. So so a mesocycle is essentially a progressive overload cycle, usually over a four to six week period of time where if you might be increasing your sets or increasing your reps or increasing your weight forcibly week over week over week, that's how you overload it. And then you do a week of deloading in between. And then he was asking a question around natural versus enhanced. To be honest, training natural versus enhanced should be equal to each other. I think that recovery times may be quicker. Recovery times are quicker with enhanced athletes. That's the most important thing about enhancement in general. However, I don't believe, me personally, I think that you should be as linear as possible, keep progressive overloading, maximize recovery to the best of your ability, and keep pushing forward. And that's where you're going to tap into your best genetics. If you need a deload, listen to your body, take the time off. But that usually when you're enhanced, 
your central nervous system is going to be completely blown out before you need to deload, but deload right before you burn it out. Essentially. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just don't comp overcomplicate training. Man. Right. I, I, I don't have much to I agree. No, I agree. I think it should be kind of stupid, simple and keep pushing forward. Progressive overload. Uh, should lat training be altered depending on lat insertions? Example, someone with high lat insertions versus low. I, I mean, I, training is, you know, guys, I, I go in and I look at the back. You know, you've got, you got your low back, your middle back, and your upper back. That's how I train back. Uh, I, your insertion is your insertion. I, I, you're not going to lower it. You're not going to change it. Look at your back in three parts. Make sure you hit it, hit those three parts, and uh, you know you'll you'll develop top to bottom. Uh, I don't think there's anything you can really do uh, to to change your lat insertion. Um, you know, so uh, just build what you got and and hit it from a total viewpoint. Yeah, and I'm in agreement there. I think if someone has mind to muscle connection issues with activating their lower lat inserts, then you, I like unilateral pull downs and give a light slight. Uh, lean to the side, whatever side you're pulling down on to really activate your lower lat. And that's about it. Um, warm up your entire back and then smash your back. You lift hard and heavy with back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. God, this thing sucks. It keeps dropping down when I'm trying to like scroll back up to like. Okay. I know there's a bunch of them that got missed. I can't get back up. Yeah, someone someone asked, uh, what if Ninzerol is no longer working after continued use? So here's the thing is, if you're, and this is around uh, hair loss, so I'll, I'll get your opinion on this also, but just in general, hair loss is going to come and go. If you're genetically prone to hair loss and you're on androgens of any sort, even TRT, hair loss is going to be a continued battle for the rest of your life. Um, I'm speaking just from my personal experience, Scooby shaking his head up and down. So I don't know. I call you Scooby, Jason. Scooby. Yeah, it's fine with me. That's the people you'll call me. <laughs> um, Good. And, you know, the biggest issue that I see with continued hair shedding, one, you're probably on minoxidil or Rogaine to regrow your hair, which is going to increase hair shed, which is perfectly normal. We're going to constantly have hair shed. The drying of the scalp is what I see the biggest issue with. And people in bodybuilding not only use androgens, but they usually have poor guts. And Jason's going to shake his head up and down to this. 90 to 95% of bodybuilders have gut dysbiosis of some sort, probably every other year, honestly. Even if you treat it, you're going to get it at some point. I mean, it's because they eat eight ounces of meat, eight ounces of cooked meat, eight ounces of cooked meat. It's like 450 grams of protein. I don't even know what the fuck they're, they're eating. And yeah, they think they're going to have good gut health. I mean, it's just... So. Yeah. Ongoing battle. Uh, someone asked when to deload. Should they be programmed or based off a of feeling? And how do you know is appropriate versus fighting through? So this depends. Um, if I'm dealing with someone who's had hormonal dysfunction, metabolic resistance, uh, those types of situations, hormonal dysfunction, and especially if they're cortisol dominant where they always rise, I'm going to program it ahead of time. So I'm going to let you train maybe hard four to five weeks. And I don't give a shit if you feel great, you're deloading. That's the point. I walk you up to the edge and then I pull you back. I don't wait till you've fallen over the edge. Then we're fucked. Yeah. Um, if it's someone who's like, sorry, but like a, a male on pads, I'm probably going to say, let's discuss how you feel. Uh, females are going to be more affected hormonally, cortisone, by training. Um, and so, you know, it just depends who the person is. Uh, like I said, someone's dysfunctional, I'm going to plan it. Uh, someone that is healthy and, you know, then you add peds in, they're going to recover better. Let's just talk about it. Like if you see someone starting to sleep poorly, digest poorly, uh, lack of libido, brain fog, not wanting to go to the gym, um, all those things are a time to say, you know what, let's take a week off. Let's pull back. Um, all those things. So it, it depends. You brought up something really uh, good, Jason, that I kind of want to dive into for one second. Uh, you brought cortisone within women or cortisol. Yeah. Um, in prep, what I found with women personally is actually backing off their training days and giving them complete days off of training 
So three days a week of training with women is very, very effective for most women in prep. Four days a week max. And then obviously towards closer to show. However, I find five, six days a week of training is very counterproductive within women in particular. Yeah, 100%. I, I usually cap it at four. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. I'll just go on down. There was, uh, let's see. Someone was talking about uh, spirala spiralactone implementation for water retention. Uh, but she only takes it when she travels or on cycle if it's really bad. Um, I think there's personally better things for water retention, even though it is a do. Me too. I mean, you know, there's there's a root cause to that issue. Um, so I would get to that rather than just throwing a Band-Aid on it. Um, best supplements to aid fat loss for a natural athlete. Um, I'll go first. Um, so, you know, you got your L-Carn. Um, you could do injectable, which is very, very, uh, helpful. If you don't inject because you're a natural athlete, totally get it. Use liposomal. My company, no ethics has one. It's great. Um, yo, him being hydrochloric is not going to be banned in any of your organizations. You got to check what's banned in your organization, but yo, him being as of date is not, um, there was something called seven keto DHEA that you could help and it use, and it would upregulate thyroid. They won't let you do that anymore. Um, but our thyroid boost would work really well. Um, there's nothing in it that's banned. Our thyroid boost plus will give you prevent the down regulation. So it's not a direct fat burner, but it is keeping thyroid supported. So, I mean, over then your metabolism's better, your feed efficiency is better and et cetera. You're going to, you're going to continue to burn fat better. Um, just making sure you get enough water in i know it sounds simple but like make sure you're, you're hydrating getting a gallon plus of water in when you're in a fat loss phase um see if there's anything else for me those are my main three i don't go i don't take any of those like supplements that spike norepinephrine and all that stuff i i i don't use them um you know those are those are my my main three i think that i use for natural athletes if something else comes to mind i'll i'll spit it out but david what do you think yeah i actually am gonna agreement i like that you brought up set of seven keto because no one brings that up anymore but it's so yeah. very effective yeah. um now i think my three you already mentioned your hembine which is my number one that it might as well be a, a, a drug it's so strong and so effective at what it does green tea extract is extremely effective in conjunction with it and then ca caffeine let's be honest caffeine is an amazing way to um increase heart rate fat burning and the other one, so I like Morpho Burn a lot. Um, that that's a big one for me because it has a version. It has T two in it, which you're bringing up Thyro Boost, which I believe you have a form of T two in there as well. It's not going to directly impact fat loss. Well, I guess it can directly. Th th thyroid can um, if you upregulate T three production. However, it's more of an indirect property of increasing metabolic rate and preventing it from coming down and down regulating, which it will down regulate as food decreases no matter what. Sure. Yeah. Next one is after treating a stream case of SIBO and H. pylori, what is the likelihood of it reoccurring? Recommendations to protect against this and when the diet is extremely regimented already. I'll kick it off. Um, so first off, you know, if you use antibiotics, you probably have about a 50-50 shot of that coming back, just being honest. Um, if you use the proper 5R program like I employ, it's probably – 75 80 percent it's still not 100 um you got to take precautions afterwards to keep it away so what are, what are those um so i make sure that i keep someone on just two caps of our gut defender that's the one that has antimicrobial so it's a very small dose i keep that in for eight weeks after um obviously you have to rebalance your lifestyle which you should be doing anyways but you're going to need to continue on with whatever dietary you know changes you needed to make sleep um not over stressing, not over training, not under eating, all those things. Um, and then you should be on a broad spectrum probiotic now. You shouldn't have been tr trying to kill it. That's a big mistake people make. But now you should be on a, on, a, on a broad spectrum and you should be putting FODMAPs back in. Usually I lead with blackberries first. It's an easy fruit. And then I'll put asparagus in and then layer on. And if things are bothering, you can pull it and you can leave the ones that work. That's going to feed the good bacteria. You should put things like kimchi in, um, you know, sauerkraut if you like it, kefir, all those things are going to feed the good bacteria that you're putting in with the probiotic. And then I use our Utilize. It's a pancreatin with betaine. And what that's going to do is push their food through. Most people have 
poor enzyme activity somewhere. And that's one of the root causes of SIBO, not the only, but one of the major ones. And so if you keep food moving through better and support the enzymes, you're least likely to have this happen again. Um, let's see. So I leave a little bit of gut defender in for eight weeks. I put them on broad spectrum probiotic. I put them on digestive enzyme. I add the FODMAPs back and I rebalance their lifestyle. I think, I think that's about it, you know, for the most effective. Now, number one, don't go on an antibiotic right after it. I have clients do this. I just had a female, I had, I had her good. She got a UTI. She didn't ask me. I could have used, I could have used natural remedy. She got on antibiotics for three or four weeks or three or four days. And now she's feeling like shit again. So that's a bad situation to be in. Try natural remedies before you add it. Um, that's going to set you back big time. Um, I don't know. I think I rambled enough, David. No, you could. That was pretty darn comprehensive. So uh, usually UTIs are actually caused from fungal overgrowth in the gut anyways. So she's probably having something going on there. So completely agree. Blast some candida naturally. And even something so simple as caprylic acid. Um, when it comes to making sure it doesn't come back, I'm completely in alignment with what you just said. I do like immune goblins. Mm -hmm. So your product, actually his product is yep. phenomenal. Um, so any form of colostrum, well, good colostrum, good colostrum is hard to come by, um, but proper colostrum for IgA and bloat is phenomenal, especially one reintroduction of high FODMAPs. Taking it slow with high FODMAPs. Don't go out and have a pizza after you're done with the SIBO protocol, even though you're probably craving tons of fruit from being on a low FODMAP diet for so long and monitoring it be very very regimented i like the list of foods that you just gave even some of the low fodmap foods like blueberries for instance goes a high fodmap relatively easily with a higher amount i think even increasing that from a low fodmap into a high fodmap is one that i do and i actually like bananas for the fiber so um i think that you covered everything also to be honest very comprehensively so yeah. cool that was what dose do you see Primo as an effective AI for a heavy aromatizer? Would it be one-to-one -one with test Primo or response dependent? David, do you, have, do you have an insight? Yeah, this is an easy one for me. I've seen everyone uh, from all the way up to one-to-two ratios, where if you're a he true or heavy aromatizer, um, honestly, you should probably lean on towards more of a masterone than Primable, in my personal opinion. And then it's probably closer to a one-to-one -one ratio. However, on a Primo, it could go all the way up to one-to-two ratio. And run labs to make sure you want to know where your estrogen sensitivity is at because estrogen is phenomenal. You don't want to rely on AIs to the best of your ability. The higher your estrogen can be without getting negative side effects like gynecomastia and stuff like that, the better off you're going to be. It's cardiovascular protective, neuroprotective. It helps you, it's the number one hormone that helps you with sex drive. So it's more of estrogen sensitivity and also know where your numbers are on paper and it will change over time. For instance, I used to not aromatize heavily and I still don't aromatize too heavy, but my, as I've gotten older, I actually aromatize more and more. Now, part of that is actually because of my gut. And I'm sure Jason, you've seen it all the time on paper, how yep. the gut and the permeability of the gut and glucogranidase affects recirculation of estrogen. And it's usually phytoestrogens that are being recirculated or bad estrogens. So um, how you pathway the estrogen as well is extremely important to notate. And if you ever want to know how to do that, what, how you're pathwaying, a uh, Dutch test is awesome. So Jason, go ahead. Um, you know, I, I think David covered most of the things I was, I was thinking of, you know, I, I don't know that I've ever read research on this, but anecdotally, I was finding one-to-one -one with the Primo. Like, so, um, something I really like to do. I mean, I, I say I'm retired. I don't know. We'll see, but it's like a 200 test and then add 200 Primo with it. Um, you know, so I see that work really well for me as a one-to-one. -one. Um, I don't know as it gets higher, you know, that you need to do that. You know, if someone's taking 750 to make a test, I don't know that you need 750 to make the Primo, but I don't, I don't know because I, I don't, I've never done it. So I'm not real sure. Um, but I do know that, that both Primo and, and Mass do act as a nice AI. And so you're on the right track with not wanting to, uh, use, you know, uh, Arimidex and things of that nature. So. No, I think that's awesome. Yeah, usually one to one is about where it's at for heavy aromatizers. Let's see here. Uh, H thoughts on HMB. Holy shit, that's a uh, 
that's a that's an old one. Uh, should I think that goes back to like Bill Phillips is like EAS, <laughs> uh, right? Like that's that HMB, right? Um, I don't know, guys. Like I, I heard that it helps prevent muscle loss when you diet. That's really where it shines. Mm-hmm. I don't really know. It, it's not very prevalent on the market these days. I'll be honest with you. I never really used it when I when I when I prepped or I dieted. So um, I don't know. I don't I don't know how effective it is. But that's what I've read. It when it shines. David, you got any input I on it? About my first time using HMB. So when I found out about it, I was in college actually, and this is when I was still natural. I was like 135 pounds. I got up to like almost 220 pounds naturally in like two years. And I took HMB, and I think it was more of a placebo effect more than anything else. But I felt like I was getting more gains on it, but it's mainly for muscle prevent, uh, wasting yeah. more so than anything else. I'll be honest with you, the best, the best thing for preventing muscle wasting is probably gonna be something taking creatine and making sure your protein is, is sufficient. Uh, HMB I'm sure is not gonna hurt anything, but um, L-glutamine works very efficiently for that as well. So uh, HMB, I think it's an expensive, a product that's why they kind of took it off the market and they don't put it in products anymore is it effective probably super effective for the bank for the buck probably not yeah yeah i i i couldn't agree more yeah um well someone's asking what is a typical plan to, to heal gut dysbiosis but i mean you know that's a that's a whole consult but i will tell you that if you think you have it um, you know, you bloat a lot, you got gas, you got constipation or diarrhea or both. You, you bloat from water. I'd get a GI map and start there and then hire a coach that knows how to freaking read the thing and then, you know, rotate proper killers and put you on a proper five R protocol with proper diet, setting it up, all those things. I flush my people first so that their estrogen is moving and just, you know, there's a lot to it and it's not something we can cover right here. But, um, I would say if you don't know how to fix it, hire someone that does for sure yeah and also just on that note hire someone that does make sure that they didn't take one gut testing course or sit in a class and all of a sudden they're doing gut protocols make sure that they're very well versed in whatever they're doing and have experience doing it um now people like jason do an amazing job teaching the class but it's not an overnight class where you can just all of a sudden okay cool i'm going to start solving SIBO cases uh because there is a lot to it as you could hear just from coming off of the SIBO case yeah, yeah. Um, so the sprenolactone uh, question got followed up on. Uh, sprenolactone, from what I read, is oftentimes used for high blood pressure. So do you think it could be why she has low pressure? Also, I feel her acne is gut-related due to the antibiotics failing. So I don't know, David, if you want to chime in. Yeah. I mean, sprenolactone is a diuretic. Yeah. Which- uh, we know it in the bodybuilding world by aldactone is the generic name for it. So it definitely can affect blood, will definitely will affect blood pressure to a degree. Um, if it's low blood pressure, try to increase her sodium intake to the best of your ability. If she's going to be staying on spirolactone, again, I would recommend going towards a root cause, which is probably gut related. When you're taking antibiotics, you're blasting your microbiome. There's very few antibiotics that are not going to hit the gut. Um, there's one that's really cool that only resides in the gut. And Jason, I'm sure that you've used it is Rifaximin. Rifaximin is a phenomenal antibiotic, but it only targets the gut. But if they're taking rounds of antibiotics, it's going to be blasting that microbiome to outer space. Uh, probiotics can only do so much. If she already has gut dysbiosis, sometimes adding probiotics into the mix may make things worse. So run GI mapping, figure out what the root cause is and start targeting uh, the root cause. Yeah. Yeah, very much. I mean, yeah, that's that's everything that needs to be said on that. I don't have anything else to really add on it, but it's definitely probably the cause of her low blood pressure. Um, is there supplementation you'd recommend for low cortisol, or is it beneficial to take a natural route by backing off training, more sleep, recovery, and cutting caffeine? I'll go first. Um, so <clears throat> all those things you just mentioned are the first things you need to do. Um, in my system, I always work rest first. Um, so yeah, you know, if you have adrenal insufficiency, uh, I'm going to, but I'm not going to allow you to train for probably two weeks, maybe three. Uh, you're going to walk and you're going to do a lot of restorative yoga, deep breathing, parasympathetic, kicking in. Um, because even though now you have low cortisol, it doesn't mean you're not under stress still. You, you are. And now you're inflamed because cortisol, when it's low, inflammation goes up. 
And so I just looked at someone's labs today. Low cortisol is like a six. Guess what? Their CRP was 3.3. So um, that could be going on too. So I'm going to, I'm going to rest you. I'm going to flush you. And all flush means is a low, uh, is an anti-inflammatory type diet setup. Lots of water, take your caffeine out, rest more, get on a Mediterranean style diet. If you really want to take it to one stage net, uh, or another level, get on our Metapure and Optipure with new ethics. That's going to crank phase one and phase two detox. It's going to lower inflammation. And then you're going to be set up on a nice diet. You can start feeding yourself up as you're resting and your endocrine system is going to be cranking now. And then you can come in with some supplements. That's last in my, my program. So yeah, our adrenal health, adrenal health with new ethics is made for this. Not our cortis. Our cortis will lower cortisol through metabolism being sped up with phosphatidylserine. You want glandulars and minerals and vitamins to bring that up, and our adrenal health does that. I would pair it with licorice root, assuming you don't have high blood pressure. Licorice root slows the metabolism of cortisol down, so you're going to get an immediate spike as you're doing all the other things that are right by resting and you know getting the right diet, anti-inflammatory diet. And so those would be my main two big supplements. I'd probably throw some extra vitamin C in too because it's cheap, like two grams a day. And then you got to just work the program and rest. Like, And it could take you six months to dig out of that hole. I've seen 18 months on a true flatliner, meaning like a stage four uh, adrenal insufficiency. So you got to be in it for the long haul. You can just throw a few supplements at it and be like, oh, I feel good. Um, it's just not going to happen. So I hope that gives you a, somewhat of a of – a, of a, plan to go for but these are types of things that people come to me all the time for me to coach them through and it it takes time it takes the right program you can't just throw a few supplements at it and think it's going to go away or get better yeah the first place that you start is with lifestyle um circadian rhythm everything that you said originally uh, plus circadian rhythm i think adrenal glandulars is probably the only supplement uh, that I would probably add into the mix that you could probably remain on to help you kind of dig out of the hole, but mainly it's lifestyle based. And that's not what people want to hear because they want an easy fix. I want to go back to the gym and crush the gym. And it's just going to be a recipe of disaster because next thing you know, one, you have no cortisol or high cortisol to low cortisol. That's usually what happens. It's kind of like seeing Hashimoto's where it goes or Graves disease where it goes from high to low. Um, same thing happens and you need to have cortisol. Cortisol is actually the most important hormone for the body. Without cortisol, we have a heart attack and die. So take the time off, rest, recover, and go outside for walks. That's the best thing that you can do. First thing in the morning, cut off blue light before you go to sleep. Meditation, breathing of any sort is phenomenal for you multiple times a day, not one time a day if you're in an extreme case. And I agree with uh, Jason on what you said with extreme cases and how long it can take. The longest I've personally had was a 12 month case. That was the longest I've had so far. Yep. So, yep. yep. That's about, it definitely takes a while. You know, stage one and stage two of adrenal dysfunction is easier. That's when your cortisol is high. Uh, it's easier to fix. Um, when it's already crapped out and the gland doesn't want to work optimally, that's harder and it takes a lot more time. Uh, someone asked, what brand is that from your company? I assume they mean me, uh, Adrena Health and Cordy's. They are from New Ethics. You can go to newethics.com. We're a functional slash performance brand. Um, yeah. What else do we got here? Uh, da, 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 da. Do a woman need to take probiotics? If yes, recommendations, please. You can take it, Jason. I, I mean, is your digestion good? If your digestion's good, you're having one bowel movement at least a day. It's a three or four on a Bristol stool chart. Um, no foul, over, overly foul gas. You know, everyone bloats a little bit, guys. It's normal to have a little bit of bloat, uh, especially by the end of the day. Uh, if, if you're having good digestion, I wouldn't throw someone on it. What if it throws you off? What if it, what if it causes imbalance? If you're not having great digestion, maybe – but usually if, if someone's really lit up, I want a GI mat because throwing in that probiotic could make things worse. So it just depends. Um, but it's not a necessity uh, by any means. David, what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, everyone asked me about probiotics. I think probiotics is number 10 on my list for a gut supplement to put someone on. Uh, I would rather look at the upper GI system and make sure you're digesting food better before even getting into probiotics. So I'm in complete agreement there. If you do a probiotic, I really like spore-based probiotics. Uh, you also don't need to refrigerate some of them. So a lot of these probiotics are dead by the time you get them. Uh, spore-based usually can be unrefrigerated, not all, but most. Okay. 
Um, are you a licensed functional health coach? If so, where did you obtain your training? Um, I can answer this one really fast. I'm not, so you go ahead. Uh, so I did my training with uh, a, a functional doctor. Um, I got a certificate for a functional health coach. I don't know that it's a license. I don't know that really a license exists. Um, you can get certainly go to a number of different um, functional medicine academies and get and get a, a certification in it. Um, but license almost seems to suggest um, like a like a doctor license, things like that. And maybe it exists. I'm not sure. I've always had certifications, and that's all I have is a certification. Yeah. Um, so I, I took a program. Um, I was at a chiropractic college in Minnesota and I studied under a Dr. Charles Sefcheck and I went in five times and uh, we did about eight, 12 hours a weekend and I learned about all the systems and how to help it. So that's what I took. I forget the name of it to be quite honest with you. Um, so that answers your question. Hopefully I studied under some medical doctors. They weren't actually functional doctors and I taught myself the functional side of it because that was some holes in the knowledge of some of my mentors that they had. So I kind of had to plug the holes of what I wasn't learning. So that's how I went about it. But medical doctors actually where most of my training was under. Let's see. What is a natural remedy for a yeast infection? Because when I do get them, I so don't want to take antibiotics. David, you want to throw anything out? Natural remedies for UTI. So I like acrylic acid. Um, I always forget the name. It's, it's an acid. It starts with a U. I always butcher the name. Uh, but Thorn has a supplement. It's Thorn SF722. Works really well for killing off Candida. Uh, those are the two supplements that I usually use when trying to kill off Candida within a gut. They work very, very effectively. Uh, I know you're going to add some more to this list, but those are the two most effective that I see. I do it multiple times a day. It's not just a one serving a day kind of thing. It can be sometimes with three to up to five meals a day. It depends. You also don't want to blast it too hard because it will mess up your digestive system pretty fast if you go too hard. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of times you are dealing with something in the gut there. Um, so my, the gut defender that I use a lot uh, from New Ethics has caprylic acid in it. Mm. Uh, and then oil of oregano, that stuff will kill anything. Um, so you do like two drops every other meal. There's one called oreganol. Uh, that's the one I use. You can go on Amazon. It's very effective. Don't quote me on this because I usually I always get back, back in my GI map guide and, and look things up. But I think Saccharomyces boulardii as a probiotic is one that will kill candidas and also help rebuild gut lining. It's really nice in certain situations. And that's one of them. I believe it helps kill candidas. Um, so yeah. those are, you know, my certain things, but guys, if you uh, want more natural remedies, like you can go to the GI map website and there's a guide there and you can literally go under yeast and fungi. And like, that's what I do when I read my GI maps, I don't have every killer memorized. I get the guide out and I start looking. I'm like, okay, I'll layer this in with this and this and this. So, uh, but the ones I have memorized, I gave you. So. Yes, SAC B, by the way, super effective actually for killing off candida. There you, you go. just have to go in houses because I think usually it's a 5 billion count and you can do like 15 billion at a time, multiple times a day kind of thing to really hit it hard. Yep. So that's, that's a really good one. I, I haven't thought about that one in a while, but I have used it in the past. I use it all the time in that situation. Uh, so it's a, it's a really effective one. Uh, um, when would you have? berberine in a fat loss phase uh i mean it's not a direct fat burner um it's a glucose disposal agent and it also can actually uh be used in SIBO <laughs> protocols and it's one of the ones like oil of oregano which will pretty much kill everything so you could use it for candidas too um so berberine you don't want to go too crazy on it like i actually had a guy uh as a bodybuilder he's, he's knocking on the door of his pro car and he, he loves our gda max and he was taking a ton of them on these high carb days and then the next day he's, you know, he's, he's having the shits. And I said, well, you know, they use that to kill, you know, overgrown bacteria in the gut. And he's like, no, I really didn't. I was like, so you're really just disrupting your microbiome. That's why you're crapping your brains out the next day. So my, my answer is if you're going to use it as a glucose disposal agent, I'd probably not go a higher than a thousand milligrams a day. Um, and you know, you can put it in from the start of the fat loss phase. Why not? Uh, it's going to make you more efficient at, uh, you know, uh, insulin sensitivity is going to improve. So, so why not?
you know, it's a driver of one of one of the drivers in our GDA Max formula. So berberine has been shown under uh, studies to be as effective as metformin. I'll be honest with you, when I use both for the first time, I got leaner on metformin. Um, so I don't know if it is effective, but studies say it is. So there you go. Yeah. And just for my relative, berberine is just an amazing supplement to be on year round. Again, don't go overboard with it, like he's saying. And it also helps with cholesterol. So there's a, it reduced down oxidative stress when in the dieting phase and a fat loss phase. But anytime you can upregulate AMP-K, it's phenomenal for longevity. So there's a lot of benefits behind it. And then if you're talking about metformin, which Jason was just referring to, there's studies that show that it reduces down IGF-1, which is amazing for anti-cancer prevention. And we could go down another rabbit hole of potentially PCOS and anti-androgenic effects because berberine and metformin work almost identically to each other. However, there's a little bit of nuances between, I think berberine's better for an antimicrobial. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thoughts on semaglutide? I mean, I'll go first. I own a hormone clinic. We, we, we script it. Um, so semaglutide is an amazing peptide. It is being abused. And when I say that, what I mean by being abused, in my opinion, it needs guidance. Um, if you give it to someone who doesn't know how to diet, they are eating a typical American Western diet, what's going to happen is they are not going to eat because you lose, by the time you get to about 0.75 mg to 1 mg, really food does not, you have no cravings for junk, you have no, you can go for hours and hours and hours and not eat. Great, right? But the thing is, you've got these people eating 500 calories, if that, they do this for 16 weeks, they lose 35 pounds, and then when you remove it, they're very removing it right away, they're not titrating backwards, and then they're gaining all this weight, and then they're in the newspaper saying how bad of a peptide this is. If it's done right, it, it's, a, it's an amazing drug, and it actually can re reverse weight loss resistance, because what semaglutide does, it helps retime your insulin release, a little bit of release insulin spike. So when you eat, sometimes people's insulin, re uh, insulin spike gets off because of all these dieting, leptin and ghrelin is dysregulated. So this helps you release a little insulin, but it also pulls down glucagon. So then you stop dumping carbohydrates into your bloodstream, which is the problem with weight loss resistance. They're dumping, they're dumping, they're eating carbs, and it's all just gummed up. So it's an amazing product to actually help reverse uh, meta uh, metabolic resistance if you're, if you're one of those people that like, you've done everything else right. You know, you've ate up, you've, you, you've flushed or whatever, you've, you've lowered inflammation. And you can't get I use some glutide then, but but by then they've learned good habits because I've done everything else. I've got their hormones right, so they have good habits in place. We use it. You start low dose, 0.25 mg for four weeks. It's one time a week, and then you titrate up as we're bringing the the diet down. Don't go zero carb on it, especially if you're training. You will lose weight or muscle. But I do throw in potentially some low carb to low ke to keto days with it sometimes on off days. And uh, when you get to where your fat loss or weight loss is, titrate it backwards as you bring your carbs up. So by the time you get down to 0.25 and you can pull it, you should be back to 18, 19, 2,000 plus calories. And now your body's not um, you know, being shocked. And I find people that use it that way, when they come off of it, now their body behaves like it used to. They're gaining lean muscle, they're, they're staying leaner. Uh, so it's a great peptide, it's just being abused is the problem. And I'm sorry, that was very long-winded, but I, I, get, I get angry about it because it works so damn well and I have to fight these battles with my clients who are finally to that point. Hormones look good, calories have been raised and they still can't drop and they've got that metabolic resistance with all these different signals that are off that semaglutide can help, so. No, I think that was a really good answer. So I, it, it's a very frustrating peptide for me too because it's phenomenal peptide. In fact, uh, one of my favorite parts of it is that it's the most basal protective peptide currently out. So insulin is extremely basal protective. The only thing more basal protective or pancreas, so protecting the pancreas essentially and making sure it tastes healthy is semaglutide. I have the actually personal experience. I did it in my last prep. I did a, a, some nootropic experiments last prep and I also used semaglutide. I actually got really gassy from semaglutide even at 0.1 milligrams, which is, is one tenth of the diabetic dose. And then the weight loss dose is actually 2.4 milligrams, which I couldn't even imagine eating like one ounce of protein on that. I went up from 0.1, which wasn't very effective for suppressing my appetite to 0.2. And I was 
I felt full after my meals and I was eating 60 grams of carbs daily. That was my energy intake, by the way. I, I, go, I go deep when I diet. Um, I always have, always will. It's one of those things. It was very effective and I pulled it out going into my peak week, well, two weeks out because I didn't want to bloat from carbs and I want to make sure that I felt good when I was eating my carbs, didn't want to slow down digestion, any of that stuff. And I will tell you right now, if you have not primed yourself and your habits for eating your food, you will be ravenous coming off it. I control my hunger extremely effectively. I was absolutely ravenous when it started half-lifing out of my system. And a lot of that has to do with the dopaminic effects of you not wanting to eat ever. Once you start eating again and you start having those dopamine, dopamine urgencies and wanting to eat again, you will eat everything. And binge eating, if that was your original habit that you got suppressed, well, guess what? That habit is going to be a lot worse coming off. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, you know, it, the good and bad, uh, it needs to be done with proper care, in my opinion. Um, I have high estrogen levels. Do you recommend him? Well, uh, you know, sure. Uh, the simple answer, uh, I use our Estracort with New Ethics. It's, it's, it's a little bit more, you know, um, it's kind of a system. It's got calcium d in it, so you're hope, making sure that, you know, phase three isn't backed up or you're, you know, recirculating your estrogen. You know, it helps phase one and two. So everything's kind of covered uh, by that product, uh, whereas DIM only covers, you know, part of the phase of estrogen metabolism. But yeah, I mean, if your estrogen is running high, that's where you can start, but the, it has to leave the liver, right? So you got to make sure your liver is running well and supported as well. Um, but, but the short answer is yes, 200 megs should get you started. Any, you got anything else? No, I mean, that kind of covered it. Um, the only reason why you'd stay away from DIM or I3C is if you have cancer. That's the only caution there. Um, but other than that, DIM is phenomenal. Calcium D-glucrate, I think, is more effective than DIM for what most people are trying to utilize it for. So completely agree there. Uh, da, 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 da. Injecting every other day on long esters to improve need for AI frequency. Ah, do you want to go? Sure. I mean, if you have estrogenic issues, I find it more effective for actually reducing hematocrit rise as much as estrogen rise. Remember, estrogen is good for us. So until you can't tolerate it anymore, if you want to increase the frequency, yes, it should reduce down the amount of estrogen in the body. Make sure your digestion's good. If your digestion's good, you already know where I'm going to go with that. So, yeah, yeah. How do you treat males with low estrogen? Um, well, I mean, is there any more context to it? Um, like, how's their testosterone look? Um, how's their gut health? Uh, I don't know. Like, just low estrogen. I, I don't know that I see that without something else going on. Um, it's hard to say without some more context context um i don't know david do you have any insight no i mean you you have to have you have to have the full panel to even know where to start with low estrogen if your testosterone's tanked you're probably not aromatizing anything so uh if you have testosterone and you're not aromatizing everything something like actually an hcg can help with aromatization to a degree but yeah that's all I, I, that's why, I, that's why we kind of need more context. I, I, su I suspect they have lower testosterone too. Um, so that, that probably needs to be brought up. That's, that was why I was wondering about if there was more context to it. Um, might be, is that at the bottom? No, hold on. No, uh, you've got to have more. Let's see. Damn. Every time I keep moving, this thing a damn thing comes out here we go uh, do you have to kill off candida by eating no carbs whatsoever because my naturopath has me doing that right now as well as some supplements to really kill it off no that's a bad path to be on like so here's the deal guys you want to leave some carbs in with any like SIBO dysbiosis type situation when you pull carbs away yeah, your symptoms go away because nothing's being fed. But guess what? The opportunistic bacteria, they're called that for a reason. They feed faster. So what do you think is going to happen when you throw the carbs back in? Whew. They're going to get there before the, the bacteria you want to, to be able to feed up. So, no, this is a bad situation, and I'm really surprised a naturopath would even, like, 
be that far off base. But um, I, I, I feel pretty strongly that that's a bad situation for you. Um, and I don't recommend it, actually. David? And I'm going to be honest with you, this is becoming more and more and more common that I see this where naturopaths are doing like zero carb diets, just trying to quote unquote starve bacteria, because obviously it starves bacteria to a degree until you re-implement it, like you said. And it's a bad place to be in because once you re-implement it, you're going to be in a whole lot of pain real quickly. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bad idea. Um, yeah. Whatever I no, it will kill yeast it'll kill it'll kill pretty much everything you'll see on a on a gi map so like if i have someone who won't give me a gi map but like their you know gut scores for all my forms are like really bad and i warn them that listen it, you, one area you could have all low commensals and if we do this it's a really bad deal otherwise if you have SIBO or dysbiosis oil oregano is one of my go-to killers because it literally will kill anything on there. So we're berberine. So I usually layer in our gut defender with those two and say, Hey, as long as you don't have low commensals and that's your issue, this should take care of it. But I like to get a GI map because then I can really tailor it. Like what if they have H pylori, then I'd rather have mastic gum or, you know, DGC or that, uh, diglycerated licorice and, you know, yada, yada. Um, so I hope that helps. I just kind of rambled there, no. but I hope that answered. So I just want to talk about, you keep talking about oil oregano and it keeps coming up in conversation. Oil of oregano is one of my favorite things to take when you have an upper respiratory infection because it will clear you out. And it is extremely effective for when you get an upper respiratory infection. So. David and I worked to kill it off and definitely saw improvement, but still had lingering issues. He was yeah. saying the carbs allow the candida to thrive, which is why I wasn't able to fully heal. No, I just, I, 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 I'm not saying that you want a high carb diet. I'm just saying you want to leave some carbs in um, and you want to be low FODMAP. Um, so we're not feeding as, 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 as hard as we can. Uh, but no, I, I stand firm and I've, I've, I've killed off candidas a lot. And here's the thing. Sometimes after eight weeks, you're, it's not, it's not better. And then I rotate my killers. Like that happens sometimes. Like sometimes people aren't fully better. Um, so, you know, uh, if I'm going with our gut defender and maybe over regular and berberine, um, and then that's, you know, there's still a little bit going on. Maybe I go with like metagenics and they have a candy backed in AR and BR. Um, or maybe I go with like dysbiocide and uh, FC Cidal, which is biotics research. So if I'm still having lingering issues, I rotate my killers from one more eight week pr um, program. And if they're not better, then I pull everything out. I let everything settle, see where we're at, and then maybe go back in and, and you know, and then in a month or two later, if we're still not uh, kind of by then kind of trickling out into a, a healthy gut. So um, I don't know. That, that's my my spiel on it i agree nothing for me uh, let's see when it comes to a flush when you recommend just metapure or adding other options by the way metapure is an amazing product you guys did a good job with it <laughs> yeah it's a good one. what's the question what's their question uh when it comes to the flush when do you recommend just metapure or adding in optipure i don't know optipure i just know metapure is phenomenal to add in there um, and you can use it to support it. You can do it two times a day yeah, kind of thing. That's how I do it. So like, you know, I go, I lead with a Mediterranean diet. So it's all fish, yep. um, lots of fruit, fruit juices, bone broth, um, lots of veggies. I may put in a little bit of quinoa or like uh, some jasmine rice, but it's a lot for me of, of juices and fruits. Um, Protein is extremely low. I'm doing the opposite of what they come to me. Everyone eats too much protein. They only end up carbs. So I completely flop it. I go low protein, about 95 grams. Carbs are like 270. Fats are like 70. I know it sounds high calorie. It is. But I'm kicking the endocrine system into gear. Cortisol is coming down. Leptin's coming back up because they're finally feeding. That's going to bring ghrelin in a proper position. The whole, the whole thing is set to get the endocrine system in a better position so I can feed you up faster. Um, so the Optipure and Metapure are used. Optipure is really shines in phase one and phase two detoxification. Metapure really shines in inflammation and has a bit of help with phase one and phase two. You put them together and you're going to get the optimum result that you want. Okay. Uh, starting lean out, uh, starting to lean out journey tips help for fat loss in the belly, belly fat loss. There is no such thing as targeted. I'm just going to take this on for a second. Yep. Uh, there's no such thing as targeted yep. fat loss. If you have been storing body fat, 
over your belly for years and years. That is where you store body fat. You also are going to retain water in that area too. So you're probably going to notice a drastic reduction in the beginning. And then once you start stripping in after months and months and months, and you're getting into that belly fat, it's a slow process because that's where you've just stored it over time and the fat cells aren't going anywhere, but you can reduce how much fat is stored in those fat cells. Yeah. And then, you know, I would just say like, you know, tips for a fat loss, you know, journey. I mean, it, it's all about being consistent. 100% it's about being consistent. There's no diet that I can tell you is better than another. Get yourself in a deficit. If you like carbohydrates, eat more carbohydrates, lower your protein. If you like more fats, eat more fats. Uh, but at the end of the day, you got to be in a deficit. Um, that's where I'd start. Um, so do that and then be really consistent. And then where most people mess up is if they fuck up, they just say, oh, well, that's it. It's over. No, you get back to it. Like, you know, you don't fucking quit. You just get back to it. So that's called a lifestyle, not a diet. I mean, there's plenty of times I go out and I eat fucking pizza and I have some ice cream with my kids. Well, the next morning I get right back on it and I have all my good food. And then I build up six good meals. I go train. And that's why I'm always leaning in shape because I don't stop because I fucked up once. So consistency is going to be your biggest thing. There's no one set plan that's going to make things better. There's no one set plan supplement. If this is one of your first go rounds, just be consistent, but get your water in, get your sleep in, uh, and, and, and get your diet right and, uh, get moving and, and you'll, you'll be fine. Yeah. And, uh, probably the number one starting place where I put people on to is if you can eat four meals in a day, find four good meals that you enjoy eating and be consistent with it. So you know where your calories are at. So you can either reduce or increase. And then once you're consistent with that, substitute in protein, substitute in different vegetables and vegetables is something you can always continually substitute uh, different ones in. Uh, if you don't digest a certain carb well, you'll know very quickly. Uh, so like I don't do well with sweet potato, never will probably maybe one day down the road. Um, used to don't do it anymore. And that's where I would start. And then the next thing is steps in a day. Don't worry about cardio, get steps in a day. Usually 10,000 steps in a day is a lot of steps in a day for most people that are sedentary. And that's a nice general rule of thumb is increase your steps in a day by about 2000 and then increase that. And it won't even feel like you're doing anything. So you'll just move around after you eat and then your digestion will improve too. Yeah, sure. Um, someone said, do you need to use antimicrobials like oregano oil, mastic gum, or olive leaf extract if you're using gut defender and biofilm? Well, first off, gut defender has olive leaf extract in it, so I really would never have to add that one. Um, otherwise, yes, sometimes you need to, you need to uh, layer in uh, killers more. I look at the GI map, how bad is it? I mean, if they had maybe like three high opportunistics, I might just go with gut defender uh, as my killer. But, you know, if I've got H. pylori and I've got candida and I have opportunistic bacteria, well, gut defender does have caprylic acid in it. And so it, it does have some things to kill every one of the types of candida and, um, you know, uh, bacteria and all these. But I feel like it really shines mostly as an antimicrobial. So if I have like H. pylori, yes, I'm going to add, add mastic gum. Um, so I generally do layer in killers. Uh, because I don't really usually have a pretty simple standard um, GI map. But is it necessary? No. It, it, coaching is an art and the functional nutrition is an art. You have to look at what you're seeing in front of you and, and, and go from there. I don't know, Dave, do you have anything else to answer? No, and I was just going to touch on the biofilm part. If someone has true SIBO, there should be some type of biofilm. 100% supplement of some sort because that's one of the reasons why it's going to be so difficult and why antibiotics aren't always effective is biofilm um, yep yep and if you guys don't know what biofilms are um it's how it's how bacteria live call it they colonize it forms a news even the antibiotics can't get through it so if you really think those antimicrobials are gonna get through it, it ain't happening so a biofilm destroys that and then the antimicrobials can get can get into it um is it common for females to have periods while on full HRT? I've been on test, estradiol, and progesterone, um, not cyclical, since July and had a full period in December. Um, so you only had one period, you're saying, and you've been on TRT since July, and it just finally came in December? Is that oh, what I'm yeah. reading there? The next statement says, I've had uh, after none for seven years. So... Ooh. Damn, before, before there was no period for seven years? Okay. Do you want to go first? Or? Sure. sure. Um, the whole key to HRT is that you stay, you keep a menstrual cycle online. If your menstrual cycle goes offline, you need to run labs, see where your estrogen to progesterone ratios are, 
run them on your 20 or 21st day after you bleed. Now, if you don't have a bleed, I would definitely recommend an aura ring because you can t it will track your basal metabolic temperature and you'll at least know when you ovulate. So you can kind of count how many days after ovulation to get a general rule of thumb of where your progesterone would be highest. However, usually if you don't have a menstrual cycle, your progesterone is extremely low. That is the general rule of thumb that you'll see. It's not usually low estrogen. Estrogen is going to be more predominant where you're going to funnel into that bucket and progesterone you're going to have issues with. And usually it's due to chronic stress within women that you're going to have low progesterone. Um, but yeah, you should always have a period on HRT. And if you don't, you need to run labs and see what's going on. Yeah, I'd get some labs. My guess is what you're going to see is that you're low in progesterone. So not every woman does well with oral progesterone. At that point, in my clinic, we use a vaginal suppository. It skips uh, the gut, obviously, right into the bloodstream, and boom, now you have uh, the progesterone that you need. So, um, you know, the last thing you want to do is if it's not registering, to keep just piling on progesterone. I've seen women come in with 400 megs progesterone. They're having acne issues because of the sebum production. Um, their gut has slowed down because of uh, progesterone will slow motility down a little bit. That's why sometimes near the period, there's a little bit more constipation. Uh, it also will cause insulin sensitivity to kick in. Uh, so you don't want to just keep throwing in progesterone. If you're not getting anywhere with 200 megs, uh, you should need to look at a, a suppository. And if your clinic's not that advanced, come see us. Yeah, I, I'm in complete agreement there. I've actually seen really good results with the vaginal application as well as estrogen vaginal applications. For sure. Effective. Definitely. Um, all right. So we, I, I think we skip past this. Well, thoughts on research that suggests that the older trainee requires more daily protein because they're less efficient utilizers and more frequent training stimuli to elicit growth when compared to a 20 year old. Uh, do you want to take it first? I mean, sure. Uh, you know, first and foremost, the, the protein thing, um, I, I never really heard it. Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, everyone, for me, I still treat them as an individual. Uh, some people can do more protein. Some people can do less. I'm not going to just pile protein on someone because they're 60. Uh, it's a good way to have gut issues and to be farting and just all kinds of shit. So I'm still going to tailor it to the person. Um, and as far as more frequent training, um, I could see where they maybe need reps higher because they can't just handle the weight. So now you're like, okay, we see that like, you know, hypertrophy can happen when you get into the 20 rep ranges and things like that. So maybe you got to program that. But as far as frequency, that would mean to me that they're training more often um, and, you know, training lower volume, but they're training more often. It, I, you know, I guess if you did an upper lower four days a week, that could work. But hell, that works with, with my people that aren't 55. So I don't know. I still just tell her things to the person. I will say when I work with menopausal women, if they have no hormones and they're not, they haven't been really training much. I'm, I'm going high rep. It's not a lot of like burnout training. I'm going high rep and they're only training about three days a week. So I'm not doing this uh, more frequent training shit because they don't have the hormones to recover. Um, so, I, you know, again, it just depends what person. There's no set rule here in my opinion. And I'm just going to ditto that. Like you covered everything. I think that you could plus some of that statement. mTOR is mTOR, which is what, flips from muscle, muscle protein synthesis online, and that's dictated by protein intake. And you only need two to three grams of L-leucine to flip muscle protein synthesis online. I don't think that maybe some people are more effective at it because of androgen receptors. And that's a whole nother topic for a discussion on another time because of gene transcription and everything. That's what makes some genetic anomalies genetic anomalies. So, but age as a factor, maybe not so much. I know our organs at, over time don't work as effectively. So run your labs, see where you're at, see where you can improve the lab work and then go forth and conquer. But if you need more rest days, more rest days. I don't think the increasing frequency of training, I, I like that statement at all. I think if you can reduce down frequency of treatment, uh, the amount of frequency of uh, training is better. However, higher reps training, I think is great. Make sure that you're getting good contractions of the muscle fibers. If you're not getting good contractions, the contractions of the muscle fibers, fix your form or have someone assess you for sure. So individualized again. Yeah, I think that's about it. I think we covered everything. Uh, we went an hour and 15 for y'all. So uh, that's the longest live I've done. <laughs> uh, 
I'm but I think I, I think I'm going to uh, get on to the uh, the couch now. I've been working my ass off all day, so I hope this was helpful to you all. Um, and yeah, that's about it, Dave. You got anything else to say? No, no. It was a, it was a blast to do it with you. For I sure. look forward to doing it with you in the future as well. And for sure. I we made up for the technical difficulties. Yeah, hopefully it was we on, did. It was on Instagram's end, not our end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, guys. Have a good night. All right. See you. See you.